He'll Never Be Apart by Amiko Jean. Prologue. Celia. Later on, when they question me, I'll say it was an accident, an unfortunate tragedy, but it was neither. When they ask me what happened that night, I'll say it was a mistake, but it wasn't. I don't remember. I'll say, but I do. I, Celia Monroe, remember everything. If I close my eyes, I can still see Alice and Jason running ahead of me, holding hands, their bodies suspended in a silver moonlight, as they dash through the forest. Before everything changed, the three of us were inseparable. Alice and I especially. We were like constellation Gemini. Mirror images, forever united in the shimmering heavens. There were no stars the night Alice and Jason escaped from the facility, but even in total darkness they made it past the barbed wire fence to the other side of the almost frozen lake and through an overgrown field, where they finally found refuge in an abandoned barn. I crept in when I thought for sure they had gone to sleep, but their whispers made me pause, and my heart beat like a tuttered bird's. They vowed quietly to each other to keep running, to head west toward a better life, a life without me. And suddenly, I saw myself for what I was, the perpetual third wheel soon to be abandoned. I slipped from my hiding place, and when I found a gas lamp in the horse stall, I thought it must be a sign. Some divine intervention telling me that I was about to do what I was about to do was right. My hand didn't shake as I lit the match and connected it to the wick. For a moment, the warmth that sprang from the glass soothed me. Alice found me first. Even in the poor light, I could make out her face. We were twins, identical from our long brown hair to our two large eyes. It was the small things that made us different. Please don't, she said. Those two words had become her mantra lately. Please don't set those leaves on fire. Please don't hurt that dog. Please don't hurt me anymore, Sally. I want to shout, ball up her words, and hurdle them at her. She thought there was something good left inside me, something she she could draw out and bargain with, but the part was long gone, ground to ash by her betrayal. Jason showed up next. Once I could ha- could have stared at him for hours, his lovely face, the square set of his jaw, the green in his eyes that made me think of walking barefoot in grassy fields. Jason, the boy I loved, who always loved Alice more. He pushed the hair from her shoulder tenderly, tenderly and murmured something in her ear. The way he looked at me made my stomach feel empty and my body feel small. I spun from them and took a few steps away. I didn't hear him approach, just felt his fingers as he laid them over mine. I studied the tattoo of a unicorn on his wrist, all psychedelic colors and thick bold lines, a reminder of happier times. Just let go, he said. Let go. It sounded like an invitation. The lamp exploded on impact. Fire spread like roots through the moldy hay and slats of the dry barn. When the wind swept through the open window, bringing a new oxygen to feed the flames, it felt like I was flying. I'd never been so high. Alice fought it. I didn't know she had it in her. She screamed and tried to run for the exit, but the fire hissed and the barn buckled. Something collapsed, blocking her way. I watched as she dropped to her knees and tried to claw her way out, but Jason wrapped his protective arms around her, stilling her frantic movements. He knew it was too late. For minutes that felt like hours, they coughed and murmured pathetically to each other. Then he passed out, leaving my poor Allie to fend for herself. As she drifted into unconsciousness, her eyelids twitched as if she was lost in a nightmare. I resisted the urge to touch her, to offer her a small measure of comfort while... Fate wrote the final period on her life. There was even a piece of me that wanted to weep into her neck, the way you weep into the neck of an old dog right before you put it to sleep. It wasn't long before the police showed up. Sirens wailed. And flashing lights whirled casting the night into a frenzy of red and blue. When they found me, I didn't fight, didn't bite or spit or claw. I was lifted and then and then strapped to a stretcher. Through the open door of the ambulance, I could see the firemen hauling out their bodies like trash bags going to the curb. They placed a plastic sheet over Jason but held off on Alice. Someone shouted, this one's alive. 
They began to work on her wrecked ship of a body, pounding her chest so hard I could practically feel her ribs splintering. Die, I whispered into the chilly night air. Just go. But of course she didn't. I would have it would have been so much easier if she had.